Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, so I'm going to be quick about this. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to do this for. Maybe I'll get through it quickly, maybe I won't. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I know everyone's been sort of asking me to come back with some audiobook stuff. So it's not exactly what everyone was asking, <laughs> um, but it's something that I was really interested in. And so... For the next little bit, um, I'll be reading this. Now, I do... Well, I did. I did have a lot of content uh, created audio-wise, but a lot of it got really corrupted and a lot of it deleted through a, a really terrible accident over my phone. Um, but I wanted to get a better mic to sort of be prepared for other stuff. So I'm going to wait to return to Charlie Bone when I have that mic. But I thought, hey, while I have you guys here asking for stuff, I could, you know, come over here and uh, start reading Hemlock Grove. So I will be reading Hemlock Grove or The Wise Wolf by Brian McGreevy. I don't know if you guys ever watched the, uh, when it was on Netflix, but Hemlock Grove was a really, really good show. And, uh, yeah. So I thought, I've never read the book, and I went to the library, and I picked up the book. <laughs> so, uh, starting with part one, Adam Baratio. I hope I said that right. And these seem to be really short chapters, so I'll be going uh, just chapter by chapter here. So, Something happened. The lone wolf howls to rejoin the pack from which he is separated. But why does the pack howl when no wolf is lost? Isn't it obvious? Because there is no other way to say it. The night after the harvest moon, the body was discovered. It was nearing October, and the sun was still hot, but the leaves were falling now with intention, and every night was colder. Peter was walking home from the bus stop when he saw the flashing light of a fire truck up at Kild Kildary Park. He wondered if there had been an accident. Peter, who was seventeen at the time, of which I'm writing, liked accidents. Modern times were just so fucking structured. He saw, in addition to the fire truck, a few cop cars and an ambulance, but no signs of wreckage. He turned his head in passing, but there was nothing more to see beyond the norm. Two of the cops combing the area by the swings he knew. They'd hassled him a couple of times in the kind of obligatory cop way that, in Peter's experience, every uniform was an SS uniform. Probably some junkie had OD'd or something. There was that bum who hung around here, an old black guy with yellow teeth and yellow, yellow and black teeth, and one dead eye that looked like a dirty marble, uh, who might not have been old, really. Peter had given him a light once, but no change. Better that than paying for his own drugs. His interest flagged. Old black junkie kicks it. It's no more news than a chance of rain tomorrow. Then he heard it. One sentence. No sign of a weapon, Sheriff. Peter looked again, but there was no more to see than a milling cluster of uniforms by the tree line. And he put his hands in his pocket and went on. He had a bad feeling. Nikolai had always told him that he had been born with an unusual receptive swadhisthana chakra and that underneath the surface of things the illusion of the illusion there is a secret sacred frequency of the universe that the uh, swadhisthana uh, was the channel through which it would sing to you and the swadhisthana being located of course just behind the balls you should always always trust as balls 
Peter did not know what it was, but something about the scene at Kildare Park had his balls in a state of agitation. When he got home, he told his mother, Something happened. Hmm? She said. She was smoking a joint and watching a quiz show. The trailer was warm and smelled of sweet pot and baked apple. Hummingbird! She yelled suddenly in response to, question, to the question. What is the only bird that can fly backwards? He told her he saw, saw well, told her what he saw. He told her he had a bad feeling. Why? She said. I don't know. I just do, he said. She was thoughtful. Well, there's Cobbler, she said. He went to the kitchen. She asked if he'd been in town. Yeah, he said. She emptied his backpack of items, so small and modest, it could hardly be considered stealing. While Peter scraped through the tar of sugar at the end of the cobbler and tried to shake this feeling, the feeling that whatever had happened in Kildare Park was no good, and not in some greater existential sense, but no good with his number on it. There was a coffee mug on the counter with a comic strip character Kathy on it, and a small chip the shape of a shark's tooth that held loose change. He dipped his hand in the mug and went to the door and scattered a handful of coins on the stone path out front. Why did you do that? said Linda. Peter shrugged. He had done it because he wanted to hear something dissonant and beautiful. You are a strange customer, you know that? said Linda. Yeah, said Peter.